and has provided significant support to ESPO from our very beginning in, in 2005. Um, and ESPO was founded by Paul Kennedy, as many of you know, also Peter Lude and Magnus, who's, who's here with us today. And Linda Hall provided substantial administrative support. Um, as many of you know, Linda unfortunately died in January 2015, and Paul unfortunately in September 2016. So Stuarts um, continued their support, particularly in that kind of interim in tricky time for Esper, and sponsored um, a, an award in honour of each. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris um, Deacon, from his partner with Stuarts, who's going to announce and present the Paul Kennedy Award. Um, this year, and then later on this afternoon, uh, we're in the hall. So, Chris, and I'd like to invite Kim, recipients, to come to the stage as well to call this book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and to meet so many new people and also to uh, see the people I've had previously. Um, my specialism is in uh, international injuries, so I represent people who've suffered life-changing injuries in an international context, and uh, that obviously includes individuals that have suffered spinal cord injuries. And uh, one of the things, I was just discussing this uh, this morning with, with Magnus over a coffee, one of the things that I think is often overlooked and sidelined is the psychological support. Um, and my clients can be quite resistant to it to begin with. They may need some coaxing, but actually, uh, once they realise the value and the importance it brings and the difference it can make to their lives and their, their progress and their rehabilitation, I think they really buy into it. So the work that you guys do is incredibly important to, to our clients. And so thank you for that and the, the support that you provide. Um, I'm honoured to, uh, to present the, the Paul Kennedy Award to Dr. Lee, Dr. Kim uh, Monden, and this is for feasibility and preliminary outcomes of HRV biofeedback in individuals with tetraplegia and anxiety. So uh, it sounds incredibly complex, Kim, and uh, no doubt a very worthy recipient of this award. So uh, congratulations. for the introduction and for having me here today on this uh, special Professor Paul Kennedy Award. And I had the pleasure of sharing a cab with Chris this morning, so we met in our hotel lobby. So that was serendipitous to meet before I got here. And I do um, want to apologize. I cannot continue this. I did have COVID about 10 days ago. I'm having some lingering symptoms, which has left me with some brain fog and some vision issues. So um, get to head out of the Netherlands a little early <laughs> to go home and see the doctor, but um, I don't feel like 100% myself, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I do want to say that it is a great honor to be here today, as I mentioned, uh, to give this lecture in um, for the Paul Kennedy Professor Scholarship. And I'll be presenting on my work on a pilot study we did on heart rate variability biofeedback treatment of anxiety and stress in people with tetraplegia. And this study was funded by the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, and it was conducted in collaboration with my institution, the University of Minnesota, as well as Craig Hospital in Inglewood, Colorado. So I will start off by saying that um, I was trained in grad school as a positive psychologist, and as I was a baby <laughs> in grad school, and learning my way through these things, Paul Kennedy's work continued to come up. And so it has really shaped my work as a psychologist, really shaped my shaped my research. And so it, it truly does mean a lot to be here to, to give this, this talk in Paul's name. So thank you again. So when you look through the literature, and Marcel gave a great overview yesterday of a lot of the, the psychological comorbidities that go along with spinal cord injury, one thing that doesn't come up as often in the literature is actually anxiety. 
And when I was writing this grant, it was the first time I submitted it, the feedback I got was that we didn't have enough evidence that anxiety was a problem. And I really had to dig and dig and dig. And a lot of people were saying they were measuring anxiety, and I would look through the article, and it really hadn't. Um, and so it is a problem. Anxiety is a problem for many people in the general population. In the US, 19% of the general population suffers from anxiety. As I started to dig through the spinal cord injury literature, you, you can start to find some, some numbers of how many people are experiencing anxiety. But um, it is concerning for people with spinal cord injury and physical disabilities because it's 13% higher anxiety is in, in those populations than it is in the general population. And the literature show that this can persist for up to um, years post-injury, meaning that it becomes a chronic problem in this disability pro uh, population. Again, as we saw in many of the presentations yesterday, you kind of have that surge after injury and then and maybe it, it'll stabilize. And it's often accompanied by comorbid depression, substance use and abuse, and lower quality of life. And I know clinically, when I see patients acutely, oftentimes what I see first is anxiety, and sometimes I'll see the depression a little later down the road. And so I do think it is an area that uh, we do need to pay a little more attention to. One of the unfortunate things for people with tetraplegia um, is that a lot of the treatments that we use for anxiety, we can't use for people with tetraplegia. So things like progressive muscle relaxation, you know, something like that obviously would be hard to do with somebody who does not have um, control over all of, the, all of their muscles. So sometimes we can run in, into some, some roadblocks. Um, deep breathing can sometimes pro propose some challenges. It can have paradoxical effects. And so this is where we started to say, well, maybe heart rate variability biofeedback is something that we could, we could consider. I am not trained or licensed in, in biofeedback. I partnered um, with a colleague at Craig Hospital, Dr. Jason Nuff, who's trained in biofeedback. So he did all of the feedback part of this. I have a pretty basic understanding, so I hope I don't get too detailed questions on the biofeedback part. Um, but here's a, just a bit of a background on you know, how we currently treat anxiety, and here's where the vision issues are coming in. Great. So as mentioned yesterday uh, in the WHO guidelines, we rely a lot on CBT in our work, and we know that it's, a, it's effective. Um, and CBT has been demonstrated to be effective, but lacks emphasis on addressing the psychophysiological symptoms of anxiety. So again, you know, maybe not focusing on, on the relaxation parts, but on the... On the <laughs> And many um, psychophysiological treatments we use for anxiety, like progressive muscle relaxation, like I said earlier, aren't appropriate for people with higher level injuries. And then a lot of times our first line treatments, like anxiolytic medications like benzos, can negatively interact with effects and, um, of other commonly used <laughs> medications in SCI, such as those for sleep, pain, and spasticity. So what is heart rate variability biofeedback? I was new to this uh, this approach to biofeedback, and who here has heard of HRV biofeedback or ever done HRV biofeedback? So um, the relationship between breathing and heart rate is actually pretty interesting. It's not exactly correlated as, as we always think it is. And it can vary depending on the context and one's physiological state. So if you're tired, you're sick, like I am, you're jet lagged, you're sick, my heart rate variability is actually going to be lower, which is not as good. You want a higher heart rate variability. So when you're healthy, a lot of athletes track this. A lot of our watches, Garmin, those things, they're all tracking this now. And, and you can actually see when your heart rate variability drops, it sometimes can be an indicator like you're about to get a cold or something like that or kind of indicates like you need to take a break. So um, it, it's actually pretty interesting data once you start to learn learn how to read all this data that these gadgets are gathering on our bodies. So just for a moment, I want everybody to go ahead and take a, a slow, deep breath for me, like a slow inhale and then a slow exhale. Oh, pretty good, Krista. 
engineer. <laughs> so um, in healthy individuals, uh, when you when you take that inhale, there's actually um, your heart rate actually increases, and when you exhale, your heart rate actually decreases. And in healthy individuals, there's a phenomenon known as respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and there's a cardiologist here, so now I'm nervous. <laughs> and this means that when you inhale, your heart rate typically increases slightly, like I said, and when you exhale, your heart rate decreases slightly. And the cyclical variation in heart rate is synchronized with your respiratory cycle, so it's synchronized with your breathing. And the changes in heart rate during breathing are primarily influenced by your autonomic nervous system. So when you inhale, there's a brief brief activation of your sympathetic nervous system, so fight or flight response, leading to that increase in heart rate. And when you exhale, there's an increase of an activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which promotes that sense of relaxation you get when you exhale. And that's what results in that decreased heart rate. So we often hear, you know, like your heart is a metronome, you know, it beats very regu regularly. And that's actually a bit of a mis a misnomer. The heart is not actually a metronome. There, there is variability in the way that it beats. I hope I'm saying this right. <laughs> <Two thumbs up. laughs> okay. There is variability in the way it beats, and it changes based, based on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. And so heart rate variability, then, is the measurement of the time between successive heartbeats, also known as the interbeat interval, or IVI, which is shown on the right-hand side of the slide. And HRV reflects the body's ability to adapt to changing social and environmental demands and reflects overall cardiovascular health, fitness, and resilience. And that's why I say, like, one of our watches are measuring, that's kind of what it's measuring. It's sort of, it's taking, you know, VO2 max and your HRV and all that kind of stuff and putting, like, my Garmin tells me, like, you need to rest today. And it's taking all of that data and that's part of what it's, what it's pulling from. So we know that um, people with increased heart rate heart, heart rate variability have been shown to report self um, self report reduced stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms, and they also Im report improved psychological well being and also improved quality of sleep. So that's a little bit about well, there's a little more on the background of HRV before before I get into the study. So many people thought that this type of biofeedback training couldn't be done with individuals with high-level injuries due to the nature of their injury. But we believe because, um, because heart rate variability is um, mediated by the vagus nerve, which tends to be less affected in support injury, that it may represent a viable modality for treatment of anxiety in individuals with high-level injuries. And one of, the, uh, one of the other benefits of trying this approach is really, there's no harm in it. It's not invasive, it's minimal risk. And so um, those are some of, some of the other reasons why we, we wanted to go down this route of HRV training, HRV biofeedback. So when you're doing HRV feedback, what you're essentially doing is residency, resonance frequency training. So you're training your breath, you're training to breathe at a certain rate to get your heart rate variability within this low frequency band where you're getting more power, which is where you get the relaxation and the anxiety benefits from. So a breathing rate of six breaths per minute is hard. Has anyone ever tried to breathe that slow? It induced a little bit of anxiety for me when we were putting the protocol together. So, and I, well, you can see I run a little anxious, so that's not surprising. But um, I should probably do this more often. <laughs> um, so six breaths a minute is tough. We were a little worried for people with tetraplegia that they wouldn't be able to do six breaths per minute, that they would get that paradoxical effect and it would make them more anxious, but that actually didn't happen. And that the literature did recommend starting at six breaths per minute, and so that's what we did. Let me back up one second and say that this protocol started before COVID. This was a completely in-person protocol with the fanciest, most expensive biofeedback equipment money could buy. And then we had to shut everything down. And so we had to go commercial. And um, we had based our protocol on people's baseline breathing. So they would come in and we would see how they would breathe normally. And then we would start the training. Maybe it was eight breaths a minute for them. Maybe it wasn't six. And we would slowly drop them down based on this more like basic commercial 
technology, we had to start everybody at six breaths a minute. So we were a little worried, but it actually turned out turned out okay, and nobody had that paradoxical <laughs> effect. So at a breathing rate of six breaths per minute, it's believed that we create resonance within our cardiovascular system. So resonance represents coherence of breathing rate amplitude in conjunction with the variability of your heart rate. And that's where you see that, that rhythm in conjunction there at the top of the slide. So when optimal coherence is achieved, an individual's breath pattern and variability and heart rate become synchronous, and that wave pattern, which like I said, you see that at the, the top graph in the slide there. And the bottom, the bottom graph there is showing that, that low frequency band, and that's really where you want that heart rate variability and where you want that. And so there's lots of numbers and details. I won't kind of get muddled in the details, but we're really focusing on the amount of time people are spending in that low frequency band, which is between 0.04 and 0.15 hertz. And so that's what we were measuring is the percentage of time people spent breathing in coherence in that low frequency, low frequency band. And more power in that low frequency band means greater heart variability and greater health benefits. And so that's why that was our, our outcome measure. So I mentioned we used a, a commercial device. It was uh, no, you know, offense to anybody. It was, it was fairly simplistic. It was what we had available. You know, we were looking for options online. Um, it was actually a, a company out of Germany. They were lovely to work with, helping with programming issues and all of those things. And it ended up being fairly, fairly user friendly. It just didn't have the sophisticated, as much sophisticated measurement as, as we would have liked. But again, we were dealing with COVID times and, and you take what you can get. So um, essentially what we did this all online, participants never came into the hospital. We did it all over Zoom. So we mailed them the box with this device in it. You can see it has the chest strap there. They put that over, um, over their shirt to measure measure their breathing rate. And then um, they also, we had to down, we had to walk them through downloading an app on their phone, putting the protocol on their phone to help them through the, the biofeedback training. And uh, the study coordinator walked everybody through all of that troubleshot, all of those technical problems that you can imagine. And it actually, it actually ran fairly, fairly smoothly. So on their phone, participants would receive the visual, they could choose whether to receive visual or auditory cues on when to breathe. So it was up to them. Most people chose the visual because the auditory was um, a little stressful. I just have the five minute warning that's concerning. Okay, so purpose. As I mentioned, this was primarily a feasibility study. We wanted to show that we could actually we could do this and we could maybe show a signal of a change of effect in people with spinal cord injury. So that was our primary outcome to determine the, the, the feasibility of using a commercially available HRV product in people with uh, high level injuries. So um, these are our research questions. What is the feasibility of a remotely delivered biofeedback intervention? What are the effects of an in-home intervention? on the amount of time people are spending in that LF band, and what is the effectiveness in the intervention on reducing self-reported stress and anxiety. This is a very busy chart that shows the flow diagram of how participants proceeded through the study. As I mentioned, it was all done online. So um, this walks through the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I won't read through all of it, um, they had to be willing to, to download Zoom, which some, some people weren't willing to do during the pandemic, and be willing to, to troubleshoot some of the te technological stuff. Um, and then we screened out people who were low on anxiety, which we screened with the state trait anxiety inventory. And uh, those who met the inclusion criteria met with the study coordinator, like I said, over Zoom. We gathered a list of medications. We gave them the depression, anxiety, stress scale 21. The subject and the subjective units of distress scale. And then they were randomized, well, minimized to either the biofeedback or control group. And then both groups completed eight sessions twice a week for four weeks of either biofeedback training with the physiological monitoring 
um, or 20 minutes of just physiological monitoring. They didn't get any biofeedback training. And then after each of these sessions, we asked them to complete, um, to describe any symptoms they had during the session and then complete those outcome measures <coughs> again. And at the end of the eight sessions, we asked them to complete the DAS-21 and the SUDS again as well. And then we offered the control group the opportunity to do the biofeedback training they wanted once the study was done. And this is the consort diagram for the study. Um, 90 participants were eligible for the study, and we ended up with um, nobody dropping out, nobody withdrawing, and we ended up with 30 participants in, in our study. Some characteristics of the sample. So the average age of participants was 42 years, and the average time since injury was about nine years. And our sample consisted primarily of men, about 70%, and most participants had motor complete injuries, about 63%. And you can see that these characteristics were pretty similar across the treatment and control groups. So into the results, so we evaluated feasibility by tracking adverse events, the completion rates of the protocol, and the number of withdrawals due to undesirable symptoms. And most, more specifically, we predetermined that feasibility would be operationalized as a protocol completion rate for the biofeedback arm of greater than 80%, less than 1% withdrawing from the study due to adverse symptoms, and the biofeedback arm demonstrating increases in the percentage of time spent in coherence from session one to eight. And we did show that um, feasibility was demonstrated with 100% completion of the protocol in the biofeedback arm and no participant withdrawals due to adverse events or symptoms. So one of our other primary outcomes was, again, that percentage of time spent in, low, in the low frequency band. So we compared the average time in that, in that band across the study arms to evaluate physiological stress. And more, again, more time spent in that LF range indicates greater HRV and thus greater health benefits. Unfortunately, due to coding errors, you can see in that first row, there were coding errors in the, in the native software. We lost some of our baseline low frequency data, which was very unfortunate. Um, nothing we could do about it. We, we couldn't go back and collect it. The biofeedback arm represented by the black line here in the chart had a mean percent LF power of 41% at baseline, which increased to 45% by session eight. And the control arm represented by the gray arm had a mean percent LF power of 35% at baseline, which decreased to 21% by session eight. And across all eight sessions, the average percent LF power was 50% for the biofeedback arm compared to 22% for the control arm. And our other primary outcome was the anxiety subscale of the DAS-21. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with this, so I won't go through it. It was administered pre and post intervention. And um, this subscale measures autonomic arousal, skeletal muscle effects, situational anxiety, and the subjective experience of anxious affect. So at baseline, session zero in the table, the biofeedback arm had mild to moderately elevated anxiety, and the control arm was mildly elevated. And during the intervention, both the biofeedback and control arm showed only marginal decreases of about half a point of the anxiety scale from baseline to session eight. So we had some secondary measures as well. We looked at the stress sub subscale of the DAS-21. Um, the stress subscale is sensitive to levels of chronic non-specific arousal and assesses difficulty relaxing, nervous arousal and being easily upset, agitated, irritable, um, overreactive and impatient. And at baseline, both groups scored at the upper limit of the normal range on the stress scale, 14.1 and 14.5. And the control arm showed a moderate 2.1 decrease from baseline to session eight and the biofeedback arm showed a minimal 0.5. And then we also gave the subjective units of the stress scale, which we asked people to rate from zero to 100 to measure the intensity of their situational or emotional, their situational emotional state, such as in anxiety, agitation, or stress. And the SUDS is a validated global measure of physical and emotional discomfort. And so lower scores on the, on the SUDS reflect lower <coughs> levels of anxiety. 
So participants in the biofeedback arm represented by the black line started with higher mildly to moderately baseline set scores in comparison to the control arms mildly elevated baseline scores represented by the gray line. And the biofeedback arm showed a moderate minus 13.1 decrease in the set score from baseline to session eight while the control arm exhibited minimal change. And the between group set scores change, um, changes were associated with a moderate, moderate effect size. And it's definitely worth noticing, you can see on the graph or noting that the control group started with much higher set scores, um, thus likely leading to a larger change score. Sorry, the treatment group started with um, higher set scores than the control group, thus leading to that higher change score. But given we had such a low end, it was hard to really control for that. So we also looked at the difference between individuals with complete and incomplete injuries because we wanted to try and make some more sense out of this data and why we were getting some inconsistent results between stress and anxiety. And we found that participants with incomplete injuries generally responded better to the HRV biofeedback training than participants with complete injuries. So participants with incomplete injuries in the biofeedback arm had higher mean percent LF power than those um, participants with complete injuries. They had a moderate five-point decrease in stress and a minimal one-point, three-point decrease in anxiety compared to slight decreases in stress and anxiety among those with complete injuries. And those with incomplete injuries also have larger decreases in SUD scores from baseline to session eight, a decrease of 33.2 compared to participants with complete injuries who had a decrease of 0.3. So we learned a lot of things from this, um, from this pilot study. We learned that it was feasible. We learned how to persevere a clinical trial through, through a pandemic. Um, and we, like I said, we learned that this is feasible in individuals with cervical level injuries. We showed a signal of an effect. We showed that we could get people in that low frequency band comfortably and stay there. Um, people just kind of talking to our study coordinators would talk about the benefits that they felt unfortunately didn't always come out in the measures. So we need to figure out, are we using the right measures? Maybe we need to be picking a different, a different outcome measure. Um, we also really learned the benefits of home delivery. People love that they didn't have to come into the clinic. It was so much less expensive to deliver the intervention as well. And so that was, that was also a plus side of this. And I think it's really shaped the way that we're putting our space together in the future and really being mindful of the burden of asking people to come, you know, twice a week into the clinic, uh, needing transportation, all of that kind of stuff. So just trying to see, I know I'm probably short on time here. We propose the DAS-21 anxiety subscale as the primary outcome measure. However, as we saw in the data, only a very small within group improvement was shown on the anxiety subscale for both arms. So it's something we need to consider, like I said, should we be looking at a different, more sensitive outcome measure? Um, and then finally, um, the proposed secondary measure of the SUDS provided the strongest sign of a potential treatment effect, which is probably the vaguest measure that we use. So that, that might explain why I just saw that. And this just emphasizes those take home points. I will conclude. Hopefully, we have time for questions. I'm sorry, I went over. You did say the presentation that you did. Congratulations for the CPD fellowship. Thank you. We have questions from the end. So they they follow that they would follow um, an image on their screen, and it, it went really well. I mean, people people adapted to it very easily. It was just kind of like, okay, here's here's what the breathing teaser looks like. Let's go through it. Let's go through it together. We'll breathe together, and then they kind of just went off on their own. And did it, and we asked them to just sit quietly while they did that with, with minimal distractions. And we asked the control group to do the, do the same thing, which of course we couldn't control in the home environment. Yeah, 
follow doing it at home, but also more of a real world experiment. So, uh, but people didn't have any issue learning how to breathe at that pace. Yeah, so that was that was in our screening criteria. They needed to be able to at least have enough function to don and dock the equipment or have somebody available to to assist them. Because you're correct, we were not in the home to help them help them set it up. But I would say most people were able to do it on their own. <laughs> Because it was really just the chest chest strap. Yeah. Yeah. Have we done a follow up after the statement? We have not, no. Yeah. It would what do you think? Do you think that looking at or I think people would probably I think you gotta keep doing the training, you'd have to keep you know, keep on top of it. Um, so I think it would probably, those who did improve would probably regress back towards their, their mean, their normal. Um, but we, we do plan to use this preliminary data to, to go back and do a larger study. Um, and now we're kind of back to like, do we go back to the fancy equipment and go back to in clinic or do we do it at home? Because you'll get criticized either way. And so where do we, where do we want to take the criticism? I would rather have something that people can do in the home and do do on their own. Peer reviewers want to see something more, something different. So we're trying to walk that line of like, like you know, grantsmanship. Give the reviewers what they want, but do what's best for the population we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you.